you're listening to the Telltale channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. In this podcast, we're going to talk about Trump cult leader Johnny Enloe's latest prophecies, Lauren Boebert's slow progression into unabashed Christian nationalism, the woman who leaked private voter data to Mike Lindell, losing her election for Secretary of State. We also take voicemails. If you want to leave a voicemail, the number is 1-800-701-8573. If you want to send an email instead, the email address is telltalemailbag at gmail.com. Earlier, I was talking to somebody in my chat, in one of my chats, Discord or something maybe, about what they can do to help this situation resolve itself, the the Christian nationalism situation we find ourselves in in the United States, the extremist representatives in office and, and how we resolve that. And the answer traditionally is vote, call your representatives, email them phone bank for them, donate to them. Those are the traditional answers. But let me give you an answer that's more informed by what I see the right doing and extremist groups like QAnon. How were they successful? QAnon is such a tiny group with so few members, all things considered, but they have worldwide reach. How did they get there? How did that happen? QAnon started on 4chan originally and moved to 8chan. 4chan and 8chan are both well known to be like, uh, w- w- what's the word for it? Meme factories, for lack of a better term. 4chan and 8chan are meme factories. They pump out memes like mad. Anytime you go to any of these dark parts of the internet, you can see these memes that these right-wingers are creating. It's like part of the information war. So here's my other answer to the question. Yes, vote, phone bank, donate to political campaigns, email your representatives, all of it. Do all of that. But in addition to all of that, we should be making memes that succinctly explain the situation that make succinct points, post them everywhere. Go to Marjorie Taylor Greene's Twitter timeline and post them under her messages. Go to the deepest depths of the internet and post them all over the place there. That is how the right has gained so much power. Whoever is winning the culture war in the moment in the United States is who wins the election, as stupid as that is. Because a moderate sees it and thinks to themselves, wait, that that makes sense. Even if it doesn't make sense. Even if it's deeply wrong. Wait, that makes sense. You know, they shouldn't be talking to kids. They shouldn't be convincing kids to transition in third grade. That's not happening. But somebody made a meme about it. And a moderate who is not politically engaged saw that meme and thought to themselves, yeah, you're right. The left must be trying to do this or they wouldn't be talking about it in the first place. There's a difference between offense and defense. If you're on the defense, if you're being accused of something as a public figure or on on a uh, mass scale, the left is being accused of trying to get five-year-olds to transition to another gender. That's obviously not happening, but that's what they're accusing the left of, right? The left is on the defense now, and the only thing you can do is deny if it comes up and stay silent otherwise. That is how you deal with being on the defense as a public figure, generally speaking. We need to go on the offense, not be disingenuous, not lie, not twist the facts or be immoral or any of that stuff, but we need to be on the offense. We need to address this stuff, and take the higher ground. Make memes. Go around to people's Twitter accounts, not even just political ones, anywhere, and post these memes, post these ideas. Argue it out. Just drop this stuff and leave. That's how you go on the offense. And if you don't have the money to donate, if you don't have the time to phone bank, if you've already voted the way that you feel you're supposed to vote and there are no other options left to you, there is always a contribution you can make in the information war. This is how the right does it. 
the left needs to do it too. Don't lie, don't twist, don't propagandize, but use memes to your advantage to go on the offense. Some people asked me recently where I suggest you find these types of memes. The r slash political humor subreddit is good for that kind of thing. Take a look around on that and spread the most clever ones you find. Send them to everybody you know. Become that uncle that everybody hates talking to on Thanksgiving, except if he were fighting for human rights instead of trying to destroy them. I found this video on the Tic Tac or the Talk Block or whatever you call it. TikTok. Found this on TikTok. It is as cringy as it gets. This is the thumbnail to it. Attention, Jesus is coming back. Did you feel that? Repent, give your life to him. Tomorrow is not promised. Obviously going to be a fear mongery video, so let's watch it and see what happened in it. Okay, that sounded like a, a siren, right? feel that? So, I've been hearing some strange noises outside now for a bit. I'll open the window to show you. It's really strange. I hear wind. And I hear what sounds like maybe a highway. Is he close to a highway? Listen. It sounded like a highway to me. Okay, that's weird because the first scene she opens the window, right? And I hear nothing when she opens the window. And then there's a jump cut, and then I hear a noise. Weird, right? Not an animal, is it? And again, they're showing us a camera with no noise, and then a jump cut, and some weird noise. Not an animal, is it? Okay, so they basically go through like two minutes of people talking about they hear things. Let me just jump to the point of the video. I think it's right about here. Let's listen to where the, the guy starts talking. One popular explanation for all of these strange sounds being heard around the world is some people believe they are angels. They are the seven angels sounding the seven trumpets, which is talked about in Revelation. Oh, what does this say? You may think some things in this video could never be true, but please read the biblical prophecy yourself in Revelation 8, 9, and 11. Now, before I tell you whether I believe these are the seven angels, first, we need to know just what are these seven trumpets. And I promise you this, it will scare some of you. It will scare some of you very greatly. So scary. I mean, we haven't even established that these sounds are even actually happening and that the, that the, the guy that made this TikTok video didn't overlay this sound of a highway over just these random clips of whatever like i'm not convinced of that honestly but okay let's keep going when the first angel sounds his trumpet hailstones and fireballs mingled with blood will be cast down to earth and 33 percent of all the world's trees will be burned up and so will the green grass it will be no more when the second angel sounds his trumpet... Well, wait a minute. So after the first angel blows his trumpet, all that stuff's going to happen, right? I'm not seeing any burned up grass or whatever else he listed. So that must mean that it wasn't the first angel. Am I missing something? It wasn't the angels. Second angel sounds his trumpet. A large big mountain on fire. Something huge will fall from the sky and fall straight down into the sea. At that very moment, the sea will be turned to blood, just like in the days of Moses, and millions and millions of sea creatures will die, and a third of all the world's ships will be sunk. Now let me ask you a question. Does that sound like those strange sounds that we've been hearing very recently? This all sounds like complete nonsense to me, honestly. Well, before we make a clear decision, let's first consider this mind-blowing fact. I'm guessing he's gonna be a little fast and loose with the term fact. When the third angel sounds his trumpet, the Bible says a vast, huge star will come crashing down to the earth and will- Okay, well that's not plausible at all. Stars are gigantic balls of burning gas billions of miles away, to quote the great philosopher Pumbaa from The Lion King. If a star got anywhere near the earth, it would just incinerate it instantly. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not- 
Not banking on that. ...down to the earth and will pollute many of the waters of the earth. Many of the fresh water systems will taste bitter. What is the name of this star? It's called Wormwood. But if you have a Ukrainian Bible in front of you, some translations of the Ukrainian Bible say this word, Wormwood, can also mean Chernobyl. Okay, why would I use a Ukrainian Bible, first of all? Second, is that even true? Third, we can look at the original word in Hebrew or Greek or whatever. I, I guess this was probably from Revelation, so it was Greek. We can look at the original language and translate it directly. We don't need to look at this weird version of the Bible written by who? I don't know. In Ukrainian of all languages? Chernobyl. Isn't that interesting? Not really. It's bizarre that anybody is buying any of this stuff. This is like one of the top watched Christian videos on TikTok. Seriously. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that very interesting? And if you visit Chernobyl for any reason you decide to go there, if you stand in the town center, there you will find the Chernobyl Star Memorial. What is the Chernobyl Star Memorial? Well, it's an angel blowing a trumpet. But we're going to come back to that in a moment. See, this is all faulty pattern recognition. Humans evolved to detect patterns in everything. There was a time in history when we were being hunted by predators. Evolutionarily, at one point in time, it was more advantageous to us to see a rustle in a bush and assume that it was something, some conscious thing out to get us rather than what it most likely was, which is the wind. We are evolutionarily primed to see things that aren't there because it kept us safe. This is the difference between a false negative and a false positive. We can assume that there's something there, and we could be wrong, but we'll live to eat another day. Or we can assume there isn't anything there, a false negative, when there actually was, and then we're lunch. False negative versus false positive was the evolutionary incentive for us to assume that there's something around the corner waiting to eat us at any given moment. It led to a faulty pattern recognition system in our brains. We see something where there's nothing there. That is exactly what we're watching this guy with the gigantic gorgeous face identify for us. But we're going to come back to that in a moment's time. When the fourth angel sounds his trumpet, the Bible says that the third of the light that is given out by the sun, the moon, and the stars will be darkened. Well, that's weird. God knew that the moon is not a light, didn't he? I mean, he created the thing. So why does the Bible say that the light of the moon is going to go dark? That's kind of strange for somebody that knew that the moon didn't have light, right? Is it just me? The moon and the stars will be darkened. It's almost as if God has said to the people, Okay, for your whole life you've said, I choose darkness over the light of Christ. I choose my sin and to hide in the shadows over being in the light of God's word. If you want to live like that, fine, you can have darkness. And some Bible commentators believe that this particular judgment could be describing a nuclear winter, where literally millions and millions of... Did you notice what he said there? Listen to this again. And some Bible commentators believe... And some Bible commentators? Which Bible commentators? Can you give me their names? I've never heard of a single one. Who are you talking about? I've never heard anybody say something like that before. This is how people give themselves an air of credibility. They make up an idea, and then they pretend that people with legitimacy, people with degrees, people who know what they're talking about, agree with that idea that they just came up with. Some, what was that again? Listen again. And some Bible commentators believe that this particular judgment could be describing a nuclear winter, where literally millions and millions of tons of soot have been emitted into the stratosphere that it's nearly impossible for direct sunlight to reach down to Earth. And things get colder, things get darker, crops begin to fail, and people find it very hard to survive. 
But over to you. What do you think? Do you think so far that these trumpets are sounding like the same sounds that people have been hearing around the world recently? Well, before I reveal to you my answer on all of this, first, you must know this. The Bible says that just after the fourth trumpet sounds, an angel or an eagle in other translations will fly across the earth and say, these last four trumpets... Yeah, so he, it just gets cut off right there at the end. I don't know why he decided to cut it off. The answer, I watched part two. The answer to the question, is this, you know, does he think this or whatever? He says, no, he doesn't think this is the angel's trumpets. I don't know why he went through all of that, but this is one of the top Christian TikTok videos that I found. I was looking through and I found a whole bunch of Christian TikTok videos. This was at the top. Sadly, people believe this stuff. People bought it. And that brings us to our first voicemail. Listen to this. Hey, this is John from Missouri. Owen, I'd love to hear your take on uh, end-time biblical prophecy. My dad's a big believer. He uses it as a justification for the Bible, and uh, your thoughts would be well appreciated. Thank you so much. I vote you do. Yeah, I appreciate that. A lot of different denominations have different takes on biblical prophecy or end times prophecies. Jehovah's Witnesses have their own ideas about how it's going to play out, and I grew up with those ideas. I grew up believing Armageddon was going to take place any five minutes, and we had to have go bags and be ready for this, do Armageddon drills, the whole nine yards. That's how Jehovah's Witnesses view this stuff. In fact, they actually held Armageddon drills. In fact, I have a video of a staged Armageddon drill at a kingdom hall. This is from 2015. Jehovah's Witnesses doing an Armageddon drill. First things first, guys, are you okay? Everybody's okay, no injuries? Okay, I need everybody to try to stay calm. Let's remember our family drills. That was a really big earthquake and more than likely, we're gonna have some pretty severe aftershocks. So right now, what we need to do is I need to go turn off the gas to the house. I need everybody to go get their go bags. Cass, can you grab mine too? Because they're supposed to have go bags. They, there's even a company that sells Jehovah's Witness go bags. Great. Let's go grab those. Let's go get that done and let's meet back here. Sam, the power's out. The light switch isn't even working. <sighs> I'm trying to get a hold of Daddy, but I can't get a hold of him. Point is, every denomination has their own idea about end times conspiracies. And sadly, with a lot of these people, as I played earlier, there's a silver lining behind every mushroom cloud with people like this. There is a large movement within Christianity that believes that Armageddon can't come until Israel exists again as a country. It's some Bible verse, something or other, anyway. And then the United States set up Israel as a country again, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Unfortunately, part of that prophecy entails Israel being destroyed again. Like I said, there's a silver lining behind every mushroom cloud. I fear that there's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy with nuclear weapons. Deeply disturbing stuff. Especially disturbing to know Christian nationalists are actively trying to take control of the U.S. government right now. Knowing what they believe about Armageddon scares me, man. Scares me. Hey, Owen, this guy from Illinois. I'm going to leave two messages. I want to separate it, so if you do decide to play them or listen to them, uh, you don't have to break them up yourself. Okay, the first one's concerning that Alito, that ridiculous speech he made to, uh, I think it was the Notre Dame uh, alumni, and uh, what, what, what a joke that was. We've got to get these Christian fundamentalists, we've got to get them outnumbered on the, on the Supreme Court. It is absolutely rid- ridiculous. It is, it is disgusting. Okay, I'm going to hang up. I'm going to give you another short snippet on something else. Yeah, I appreciate the voicemail. I hadn't actually heard about this, but when you mentioned it, I decided to look it up. And this is from Reuters, by the by. Love Reuters. Fantastic news agency. Extremely trustworthy. It's a great company. If you ever want unbiased news, Reuters is as close as you will ever get to unbiased news. So let's check this out. The title is U.S. Supreme Court Justice Alito Mocks Foreign Critics of Abortion Ruling. This is released July 28th, 2022. Conservative U.S. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito has brushed off criticism from prominent figures around the world of last month's blockbuster ruling he authored 
that overturned Roe v. Wade, the landmark 1973 abortion rights decision. In his first public remarks since the decision, which has led to various conservative U.S. states imposing abortion bans, Alito dismissed criticism of the ruling, which has come from the likes of British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, French President Emmanuel Macron, and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Well, I'm glad that France, the UK, and Canada are standing up for us and speaking out about how absolutely deeply disturbing and ridiculous it is for them to have turned over Roe v. Wade. Not that it'll do any good, but still, I'm glad that someone is standing up for us. In addition, Alito took aim at Britain's Prince Harry, also known as the Duke of Sussex, who referenced the abortion ruling in a speech at the United Nations last week. Alito's previously unannounced speech was delivered on July 21st, hey, a day after my birthday, at a conference on religious liberty in Rome, hosted by the University of Notre Dame Law School. Video of the speech was posted online on Thursday by Notre Dame. Here's a quote from the speech, I guess. I I hadn't heard about this, but this is what the caller was referencing. I had the honor this term of writing, I think, the only Supreme Court decision in history, in the history of that institution, that has been lambasted by a whole string of foreign leaders who felt perfectly fine commenting on American law, Alito said. You don't comment on British law or any other type of law? Of course you do. Everybody comments on all kinds of law. Just because they don't live here, just because they're not politicians here, doesn't mean they're not allowed to comment on it. Where did this idea come from? I don't understand. I feel that, you know what, to be fair, I feel the same way on the other side. Just because I'm a man does not mean I'm not allowed to talk about abortion. I'm allowed to have my own opinion on this. It just so happens that my opinion on this is correct. They're allowed to have opinions on American law, just like you're allowed to have opinions on British law. That's how this works. I just... How did this guy arrive at his conclusions? I don't understand. How did he get here? This is Supreme Court justice, one of the most educated people in the country, especially on philosophy and law and... He's completely out of his head on Trumpism, on extremism. He's a cult member. How did he get here? Jesus Christ. You'd think that out of anybody, the Supreme Court justices would be the safest from being propagandized and brainwashed. But here we sit with propagandized, brainwashed Supreme Court members. Let's keep reading. This is another quote from the speech. One of these was former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, but he paid the price, Alito joked, referring to Johnson's plans to step down following criticism of his leadership within Britain's ruling Conservative Party. He paid the price? You think he was forced to step down because he spoke out against your decision to erase a human right in America? kind of a delusional world does this dude live in? It's disgusting, man. What really wounded me was when the Duke of Sussex addressed the United Nations and seemed to compare the decision whose name may not be spoken with the Russian attack on Ukraine. I guess he's talking about Putin. Alito added in a sarcastic tone, referring to his ruling overturning the Roe decision that had legalized abortion nationwide in the U.S., and recognized a woman's constitutional right to terminate her pregnancy. I don't understand what he's even getting at here. Alito's references to the abortion ruling, which came during a speech about the importance of religious liberty, were met with laughter from the audience. Yeah, naturally. I mean, even if people generally didn't agree with him, the natural human reaction is to laugh, especially in a tense situation. So I wouldn't take the laughter as an indication uh, that the audience agreed necessarily. Either way, what he did and what he's saying here is deeply unpopular with the American people. The majority of the U.S. disagree with what he did, and his reasoning is piss poor. In Prince Harry's July 18th speech, he spoke of 2022 as a painful year in a painful decade before citing the war in Ukraine and the rolling back of constitutional rights here in the United States, which appeared to reference the abortion ruling. Johnson has called the ruling a big step backwards. Absolutely. Absolutely was. It was a massive step backwards. Macron said on the day of the decision that abortion was a fundamental right and that women's freedoms were compromised by the Supreme Court. Trudeau called the decision horrific. Completely agree. I couldn't have said it better myself. It is horrific. And it's even more horrific that we have the Supreme Court justice who wrote the opinion out there on a stage laughing about it, making fun of people. Deeply disgusting. 
Liberal Justice Elena Kagan said in a separate appearance in Montana on July 21st that it would be a dangerous thing for a democracy if the conservative majority Supreme Court loses the confidence of the American public. The court, America's top, top judicial body, has a 6-3 conservative majority that has boldly asserted its power in the abortion ruling and other recent cases. Opinion polls have shown a drop in public approval of the court in the wake of the abortion ruling, which capped its blockbuster term that ended last month. Sadly, I, I fear that we're going to see a little worse than the abortion ruling soon. I fear we're going to see the Supreme Court try to fully overturn democracy. Basically, I, I expect them to attempt to legalize the plots that Trump had set out so that next time Trump tries to win the election that way by cheating the way he did, it will actually work. I fear that that's next on the agenda for the Supreme Court. We'll see what happens. Honestly, the Kennedy decision by the Supreme Court, damn near as disturbing as Roe v. Wade. I don't know if it's just as disturbing. It's damn near as disturbing, though. They are erasing the separation between church and state with their decision on Kennedy. It's just one crack in the wall. One more. Do you think if you chose to, you'd start as a better urban prepper in comparison to someone who didn't grow up JW? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, but I am actually an urban prepper. I have a giant bucket of rice and a giant bucket of beans, like huge, like the kind of big that you have to carry it with two hands big in my closet over there. I also have a winding radio and flashlight, water storage containers that stay good for five years, enough water to last me for two to three months for just me, my wife, and my kid. It would last us for two to three months, the water would. Uh, let's see, I've got lanterns, I've got a gas stove, and I have propane tanks. I, you know, I'm a prepper, dude. After being in West Virginia and seeing all the shit going on there, yeah, I'm a prepper. I mean, I can only prep so much in New York City. Like, what am I even gonna do here? Power lines are buried in Manhattan anyways, so I'm probably pretty safe from any like, natural disasters or anything, but it's still peace of mind knowing I have that stuff if I do need it. And I have board games here too. I, w I wouldn't be bored if, you know, some crazy shit went down. That's for sure. Just for chuckles, let's watch this video. I'm not even gonna give you any lead up to it. It's lost footage from the 90s, the 80s or 90s. That's all I'll tell you. Let's watch. We're discussing Satanism and the occult this morning and some of the dangers that are lurking about. And with me in the studio is the Dark Lord Blood, who is a seventh generation Satanic worshiper. I love it. I love it. This guy isn't for real, right? Seventh generation? I mean, this is from the 1980s, right? So how many how many years would that be? Say 30 years per generation, right? So that's a 210 years. So this is going back all the way to... <laughs> this is going all the way back to the founding of the country. This is such bullshit, dude. I love this. This is funny. Okay, so seventh generation Satanist here. Let's keep listening. I mean, are all your friends Satanists? No, or I don't have any friends, but my acquaintances are, yeah. Uh-huh. For the purposes of this study, we will focus on the number 666 and its use in the Universal Product Code. UPC codes. If you're unfamiliar, UPC codes, I know this because I was a software engineer who worked in this area for a while. They're, they're barcodes, basically. So you, you got a barcode on the back here, right? On the back of this this on the back of this uh, fun facts book, the UPC code is the number at the bottom of the barcode there. So on this one, it's like 9781095, so on and so forth. That's what that is. Most people don't realize that 80% of all toys on the market have occultic influence, and these are the most popular. It says here that uh, it actually makes the wings move, so let me uh, look at that. Isn't that amazing? It's occultic. And do you remember those uh, verses in the book of Revelation about the flying beast with the riders on them? This and could actually be taken from uh, Revelations. Sure, it looks... Honestly, 
this is no different than what we're seeing today. To be perfectly honest with you, a lot of this stuff is still happening right now. Uh, I dealt with a boy, to abbreviate it, who wanted to kill me. Uh, the name that, of the demon that was inside the young man was named Azrael. I later found out that Azrael was Lucifer's personal death angel. Not only that, but I also found out that that was the same name as the cat on the Smurfs. And what is his primary objective? Is to catch little Smurfs and kill them for Gargamel. And, and, and this kind of knife. Oh, this one's good. Watch this. It's being sold for that reason. There's something called an But it's also being sold for healthy reasons. Man, what's healthy about selling a knife to this or this? Vicky. Oh, my God, dude. The guy growled at him. And he, he clapped. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, my God, is that cringy. It does not get cringier than this. It does not get cringier. It doesn't. I've seen a lot of cringe in my life, especially in recent years since doing YouTube. That's, that's, that's rough, man. All right, let's keep listening. It's got an interesting little feature here. I'm going to turn it on. It can actually transform your voice from uh, your regular voice to that of an occultic hero. Is that yeah. correct? So let's get a Skeletor type of voice. Let me turn this on here. I, I think I'm getting it too loud. Skeletor, the master of the universe. So anyways, that happened. I thought I would share that with you guys. That is that that is as cringy as it gets, and I just eat it up, honestly. Next, we're going to talk about Trump cult leader Johnny Enloe's latest prophecies. Give us 30 seconds, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, check out my Patreon. You can also check out my Telltale Unfiltered channel, Twitter, and Teespring. All links can be found in the description. This is Johnny Enloe, and he's an extremely influential evangelical pastor. Some may even consider him one of the leaders of the Trump cult. He's been making prophecies about Donald Trump for years at this point, since 2015, since he really started to run. And the sad part about this is this guy wasn't always a far-right wing nut. This guy used to be a little bit further to the left than he is. But when Trump appeared, he just went completely off the rails with it. Now, I've talked about this clip from Johnny Enlow before, this early December 2019 clip. It's called the Hinge of the Ages Prophecy. And he's made this prophecy a billion times over the years. But I want you to hear it because something he had to say recently relates back to it. Listen to what Johnny Enlow had to say in 2019 leading up to the 2020 election. I was asking the Lord about it. He hadn't told me. I was like, Lord, you still haven't showed me. And then on March, right when I'm saying that I have this, oh, it's not an open vision, but it was a vision. And so I was like, Lord, as I'm saying that, what the first thing he said is, he is going to save you from things you don't know you need to be saved from yet. He's talking about Donald Trump. Donald Trump's going to save us from things we don't need to we don't know we need to be saved from yet. He views Trump as a savior, seriously, a savior. Jesus level savior. This time in the presidency is going to be a hinge of the ages and be known as before Trump and after Trump because of the way I'm going to use him. I'm using wow. him as a Trump card, but I'm the Trump card player. And so your nation will be known as before Trump and after Trump. And he said, the nations will be known as before Trump, after Trump. And the Lord, it was like, he said, I'm really not interested in your all's vote this time. I'm doing it. I usually give you all that option. This time I'm not. This is that is fascinating. So this guy is saying there was no point in even voting in the election in 2020. That is so incredibly deeply interesting to me that that, that he would dare to come out and effectively discourage his audience from even bothering to vote, right? No point. God's It's in God's hands now. Why bother voting at all? He said, usually I'm interested in your vote. Not this time. I'm doing it. 
That's crazy. Usually give you all that option. This time I'm not. This is a rescue operation from heaven. This is this is a, a, a moment of the ages. This will go down. This time period will go down as a before and after AD, you know, a, a, but BC, AD, the, depending on what terminology you use now. You know, in my opinion, that is completely ridiculous that the guy would even suggest that Donald Trump was so influential in American politics or in world politics at all, not just American, but world politics, that we would switch to using, like, we'd switch to using a system based on Trump instead of Jesus. We're moving away from a Jesus-based calendar to a Trump-based calendar. That should put into perspective just how important and prophetic and influential Johnny Enlow believes that Donald Trump is. That's that that's that's nutty, dude. That is absolutely crazy. Okay, so that's Johnny Enlow, and that's how he feels about Donald Trump. He's felt that way for years, years. Funny enough, he actually explained this hinge of the ages prophecy, as he calls it, uh, back in January of 2022, I believe. I talked about this when it happened. But I wanted to watch this clip again and just see what, you know, his explanation was. This is January 21st, 2022. I mean, that hinge of the ages prophecy is pretty specific, right? And it didn't end up happening. Donald Trump lost the election and we now have a new president, Joe Biden. So how did he rationalize his way out of that situation? Listen to this. From heaven's standpoint, Trump is the number one government official on planet Earth. Not just the United States, planet Earth. He is the president, not just of the United States. He is God's president for Earth at this time. But his assignment, people like, when is he going to be there? In this, the seat where Biden is, is, is way less important than people know. At some point, yes, he's going to, that seat will, uh, will be back officially where it's supposed to, I don't know the timing of it. Um, I had no idea of the full picture, the full range of everything that needed to be corrected and then brought into alignment with the kingdom of God. When I was getting the original prophetic words on it, all I, my initial stuff is the world will be known as before and after Trump when he comes in. And I was even looking at my prophetic word from four years ago. It's going to be an eight year operation for, for, for that, to, for that to happen. That's absolutely unhinged. I really don't know how else to, to phrase this. I've talked about this guy before, but the reason I talk about this guy in the first place is because elected officials, United States members of Congress, watch his show and take cues from him about what to do, about how to vote on legislation. That's why we need to talk about him. He's, he's a serious individual. Name of this book I've been reading recently is When Prophecy Fails by Leon Festinger. Now, Leon Festinger, as it turns out, is the guy that invented the term cognitive dissonance. And this was the book that you know described cognitive dissonance originally. It's about a group of people called the Seekers. It's a UFO cult, kind of an offshoot of Scientology except they were never really heavily involved in Scientology. They just took Dianetics, which was, you know, Scientology's Bible, basically, and they used it as the foundation for their belief system, too. But they believe that they're receiving messages from aliens. This is from the 1950s when all this went down. Believe that they're receiving messages from aliens on a daily basis, and the aliens told them that there's going to be a huge flood on Earth and they're going to destroy everything. And they're going to pick some people up in these UFOs and save them if they're involved in the group and all this other crazy nonsense. But the idea behind the study in the first place was that these people predicted that there's going to be a big flood on, I think, December 21st, 1954. That could be incorrect, but I think that's when it was. And it never came. It never came. So the author wrote about cognitive dissonance and how it affects people and how they get around it and how they deal with it. And what we see in Johnny Enlow 
is the direct result of cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is like a stressful state of mind that's induced by an incongruity between a belief you hold and reality. And there are a number of ways to alleviate that uncomfortability that results from reality and your beliefs not intertwining correctly. Some people feel an alleviation of cognitive dissonance when they bring more people into the fold. So Johnny Enlow is feeling this cognitive dissonance right now because he got it wrong. He predicted, I'm sorry, didn't predict, he prophesied from God that Donald Trump is going to win the 2020 election. And he was wrong. He missed it. That's a false prophecy. As a result, he felt cognitive dissonance because he deeply believed that God was going to come in and change things to make sure that Donald Trump took the presidency again in 2020. Here we sit, 2022, going into 2023. Donald Trump is not president. There is a clear, distinct cognitive dissonance happening in this guy's head. And his method of alleviating that uncomfortability, that stress brought on by having the cognitive dissonance is not only trying to bring more people into the fold, but making more claims on top of it, additional claims, like Donald Trump is actually secretly the president of Earth, not just the president of the U.S., but he's president of Earth. He's more important than we ever thought he was. So he's bringing people into the fold, or trying to, trying to proselytize. He's making more grandiose claims. I mean, these are all things that I would expect to see in somebody who's dealing with deep cognitive dissonance. It's so sad to see. But this is textbook stuff. I mean, this is the clearest cut case of cognitive dissonance that I've ever seen, honestly. He just made a new prophecy. Surprise, surprise. Like I said, some of the ways of alleviating this stress are bringing new people into the fold and making new, bigger, grander claims. Check this one out. This one came out July 25th, 2021. It's going to say some things again and controversial until we show the proof. But we'll tell you that, you know, the Supreme Court of Heaven already decertified the 2020 election. Oh, that's good. That, that Wait, did, did, did he say the Supreme Court of Heaven? Heaven. Hold on. I'm just going to say some things again and controversial until we show the proof. Yeah. A little controversial until you show the proof, just a little bit. But we'll tell you that, you know, the Supreme Court of Heaven. He did. He said the Supreme Court of Heaven. The Supreme Court of Heaven. Fascinating. Okay, go on. Already decertified the 2020 election. Oh, that's good. That, that happened the day of the, of the thievery. Why would... Okay, so... Oh, my God. There's so much here. Uh... So the Supreme Court, I assume that he's talking about, is a Supreme Court run by angels, led by God, right? Because it's the Supreme Court of heaven. It's not an earthly Supreme Court. He's not talking about the Supreme Court, is he? I can't tell. Does he think that the Supreme Court of the United States is being controlled by angels right now? It's so hard to tell what this guy believes, honestly. That happened November 3rd and November 4th. It was. Why would the Supreme Court of Heaven decertify a U.S. election? Why would they allow it to happen in the first place? Didn't this guy say specifically that God usually allows us to vote and do our thing, but this time he's stepping in and doing it for us? Why would he allow the certification in the first place? let alone decertify. Why would he decertify? Like, none of this makes any sense at all, and it is the clearest example of cognitive dissonance that I've seen in a while. Day of the, of the thievery. That happened November 3rd and November 4th. It was decertified in heaven. Wow. And so the Supreme wow. Court of Heaven decertified. So just let that resonate with you. 
Now, the Supreme Court of the United States. Okay, so he's differentiated between the two of them. So I guess this I guess heaven has a judicial system set up exactly the same as the United States. And I'm assuming he believes that because he thinks that the U.S. Constitution was given to us by God. It is. It was created by God. It was certified by God. And God chose that specific setup, legislative, executive, and judicial branch, the way that he did, because that's how heaven has it set up. It makes perfect sense, right? Now, the Supreme Court of the United States somehow freed up from some constraints of blackmail or whatever, either late June or early July, they also have already decertified the 2020 election. Now that's the rumor I've been hearing. And are you stating that? Are you coming out and stating that? He's asking if he's coming out and stating that like that because he believes Johnny Enlow to be a prophet of God who receives divine information from on high. And he thinks that Johnny Enlow has this secret information given to him by God. He is treating Enlow like an authority on this subject because God has his ear. God is giving him secret divine information that no one else has. I'm hearing it. Are you stating that? Are you coming out and stating that they did? I'm stating it. I'm stating wow. it. Wow. And you're going to see that. And and they didn't just decertify it. But in that decertification, there is whatever, a certifying of, of President Trump. Again, just so you make it clear. This Wow. So not only did they decertify the electors, but I guess they voted in new electors in the Supreme Court. Well, Johnny, I'm sorry. That's just not how it works. But me saying that would make absolutely no difference to him anyways. He does not care if that's how it works. That's what God told him. That's what his imaginary friend whispered in his ear. So he's going to believe it. And there is nothing anybody can say, nothing to convince him otherwise. The stress of cognitive dissonance will lead to people either breaking down and changing their view or digging in even harder. And in Johnny Enlow's case, the sunk costs fallacy has triggered so hard for this guy, he's not escaping. He's, there is nothing that will change his mind. Nothing. Make it clear the spiritual and the natural. I have been saying all along when people say, when's Trump coming back? I was like, he's never left. He has <laughs> never he has <laughs> never been out of his position as supreme. Um, you know why this guy's laughing on the left? Because it's so ridiculous that anybody would believe otherwise. Trump has been in there this entire time. And Biden is just the figurehead standing in and taking the heat for decisions that are made. He's only in there as the stooge, as the fool. Trump is really behind the scenes pulling the levers right now. See, this is another good example of cognitive dissonance. How can you simultaneously believe that and also criticize Biden for the decisions that he's making? In their mind, Biden isn't making decisions, right? Mutually exclusive, simultaneous beliefs is what we're watching right now. You can't believe the things that they believe simultaneously. But they do anyways. Because there's already a cognitive dissonance in their head, a separation, an incongruity between what they believe and reality. So they're trying to twist things around any way they possibly can to alleviate that stress, to make it go away, even if it means creating more cognitive dissonance. He has never been out of his position as supreme um, governmental leader on the planet. He has not left it. He's not been. There's some hey, other ones I, working closely with him, but he is number one, has been number one, and he's been that for years. Can, can I state it another way? When uh, prophets were saying there was going to be a red wave and he was going to win by a landslide in 2020, are, are you s stating that yeah, that obviously did not happen, like at all. Prophets did make that claim. There's going to be a red wave. whole bunch of people are going to vote Republican, way more than you would expect, and Trump is going to win the election in 2020. That's what they said. Didn't happen. That makes them false prophets. 
that he not only won by a landslide, he never left office having won. He's, he's now starting he, his other term, if you would put it that way. He, he won by a landslide. 2018 was a landslide, the midterms as well. Oh, that's interesting. 2018 was a landslide, the midterms. Uh, no, it wasn't. Republicans lost the House of Representatives in that election. I think they kept the Senate narrowly, didn't they? Republicans held the Senate in 2018, but Democrats took the House of Representatives, I believe. Point is, there was not a red wave in 2018. There was actually a blue wave in 2018. But, you know, facts don't matter because we're in cognitive dissonance mode now. He won by a landslide. 2018 was a landslide. No. The midterms as well. It was another theft, mm -hmm. another fraudulent election. Weird. Why didn't Trump complain about it at the time then? Why didn't he make a huge deal out of it like he did the 2020 election if there was election fraud? Like none of this makes any sense whatsoever. Again, profits paid the price for saying there's a red wave in 2018. That'll be proven too. That will the proof yeah. of that will come back. So all of those who attack the profits for not getting it right on the 2018 red wave, um, uh, just remember who you were and who you attacked and be prepared to, you know, just do the correct right thing and say you're sorry. Well, the problem here is all of the evidence contradicts what Johnny Enlow says and believes. All of the evidence debunks what this guy believes. But that cognitive dissonance in, is in his head, and he absolutely must justify his belief. He must stick to it anyways. And he must drag more people in with him because it alleviates that stress that's induced by the cognitive dissonance in the first place. That is not even close to the only time that he's called Trump president of Earth, though. He's been saying something similar for a while now. This one's late January 2021. So right after Biden was inaugurated, Enlo comes out and he says this. So there's all these dimensions the Lord is coming to affect and change right now. And President Trump still has a very uh, active, viable role in that. And he will still step in on the playing field itself. He's even under the playing field. Believe me, God is doing things with him. Uh, and, and I won't go into it more than that. But no, please go into it. I would love to hear more about this. These are all justifications to alleviate that stress. He's not a passive player. He is recognized from heaven. He is recognized as the primary government leader on planet Earth. People need to know that. And how, and how does Johnny Enlow know that? He knows that because God told him. He claims that God is delivering this secret information to him, and you must believe him. If you don't believe him, you're going to hell. Seriously. No joke. We'll watch that clip in a second. Keep listening. From heaven, President Trump is recognized as the primary government leader on planet Earth. This is one of many examples of Johnny Enlow describing the Trump test. This one's from early June 2021, so about six months after the last clip we watched. Even if you think you have 100% devotion to God, it's going to cost you. And, and this is a key time. Once we establish what a key time in history this is, this is a line in the sand. This Trump test uh, you know, it's been clearer than ever. People I've inter uh, I've been on their programs and stuff and who's being advanced and blessed um, and, and ministries that are advancing and blessing and who I see an increased anointing and who are seeing more. They're seeing more favor. They're seeing more revelatory are people who didn't back off Trump. The Trump test. If you believe in Trump as the savior, as the new leader as having the anointing of God, you will be blessed. If you don't believe in Trump as the new leader or whatever it, within Christianity, you may not make it to heaven. That's, that's what I'm hearing from this guy. Not only is he determined to bring in new believers, not only is he determined to prophesy new things, adding new claims on top of what he already got wrong, but he's determined to tell you 
if you don't believe the same way that I do, you might not make it into heaven. That is absolutely unhinged. Absolutely unhinged. I feel for this guy, honestly. I feel for him. I don't believe that this is a bad person. I think that he has been suckered into believing something that is completely ridiculous from the ground up. And that cognitive dissonance got its hooks in him. And he has no option but to try to alleviate that stress until his brain is finally willing to accept that it was a lie all along. So he's dealing with the cognitive dissonance to the best of his ability, and sadly, he's failing. If you disagree with my assessment on this or anything else, let me know in the comments section or on Twitter, at Telltale Atheist. Next, we're going to talk about Lauren Boebert's slow progression into unabashed Christian nationalism. Give us 30 seconds, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, check out my Patreon. You can also check out my Telltale Unfiltered channel, Twitter, and Teespring. All links can be found in the description. As I'm sure a lot of people have noticed, the United States is turning into a Christian nationalist country at the moment, and Lauren Boebert is leading those efforts. Ignore the dates on these. I forgot to edit them and correct them. Just I'll insert the correct dates later. This clip came out December 20th, 2021. I wanted to show you guys what her progression into extremism looked like, because Christian nationalism is the idea that the U.S. government should be controlled and run entirely by Christians. It should be a Christian state. And Jews and non-Christians of any sort, Muslims, atheists, whatever, shouldn't live here. Shouldn't live here. Now, it varies from Christian nationalist to Christian nationalist, how you would deal with such a problem. For example, in the 1930s and the 1940s in Germany, it started out with them putting them in ghettos, putting Jews in ghettos. They didn't want them... Well, actually, it started out with them removing Jews from government. They didn't want Jews re involved in government at all. As time went on, they banned them from living in nice parts of town or certain specific parts of town. They sent them to ghettos to live in cordoned off areas. And eventually they finally pretty much opened fire. This is the start of that process. Lauren Boebert wants to create a Christian nationalist state where Jews and atheists, and Muslims, and non-Christians of all sorts are not welcome in government. This is the start. This is exactly how it started during Hitler's regime. Not being hyperbolic, I'm just showing you the comparison here, okay? Christian nationalists have different ideas about how you deal with non-Christians, to varying degrees of severity. Some think you should deport them. Some think you should take them to work camps. Some think you should just take them out entirely. But none of it is pretty, and none of it respects human rights. So, with that being said, let's look at this clip. This actually came out December 20th, 2021. This was the way that she's talking about Christianity before Christian nationalism was fully embraced by the Republican Party as it is now. I want to show you guys the progression from extremist to Christian nationalist, an entirely new level. Check this clip out. This is her appearance at TP USA. So now I'm going to ask you today, we have thousands of people in this room. What are you doing with your God-given authority? What are you doing where he's positioned you? What are you speaking? What is the love that you are showing people? You have the answers on the inside of you. And I am tired of having godless people who hate America run this country. The most... 
Okay, Democrats, which is who she's talking about, are not godless by default, and they do not hate America. In fact, I don't think there's one single U.S. representative in the House or Senate that is openly atheist. I can't think of one. I don't, I don't believe that there are any. They are all religious to some degree. But when she says godless, what she actually means is not her specific brand of extremist Christian. That's what she means. So Muslims, Jewish people, uh, atheists, or just standard non-denominational, mild vanilla Christians, Methodists, Lutherans, Catholics, none of them represent her brand of Christianity and as such shouldn't be in government in her eyes. Country, the most exceptional country this world has ever known. And it is time we take our positions. We have God's grace. We have his empowerment, his ability, his influence. He has positioned you in a sphere of people that need to hear what you have to say. I didn't come here today to tell you how great I am. And oh, how hard I had it. And oh my goodness, I took a shot and did something. No, I came here to tell you that each and every one of us are called. We are not perfect, but no one's looking for perfect. The perfect has already come. Now so she's talking to a, a Christian extremist audience and encouraging them to run for government to unseat non-Christians, or not just non-Christians, but people who aren't her brand of extremists. That's what she's doing. But this is fairly vanilla, all things considered. Like, we've been hearing this kind of rhetoric for a while, right? This isn't really new. I mean, it's disturbing that they're using this kind of language in the first place, but we've been hearing this for a little while. That one was December 2021, right? This one is actually from September 2021. Listen to this. This was her appearance at a church. See Biden address the nation and the world and shows more contempt and aggravation and aggression towards unvaccinated Americans than he has terrorists. They're the same thing. There is no difference. Unvaccinated. <laughs> That's probably not fair. Um, you know, some people aren't vaccinated and maybe they hadn't gotten around to it at this time. Uh, Biden was not treating them like terrorists. He was just encouraging people to get vaccinated. And if you didn't want to get vaccinated, that's fine. That's fine. You just have to take a weekly COVID test at most private workplaces. That was mandated by most companies or many companies anyways. You don't want to get vaccinated? Fine. Get tested every week. Not a big deal. That's not being treated like a terrorist. But FYI, there is a disproportionate number of terrorists who are unvaccinated. I think that's kind of weird. Just saying. We have a problem. And that's why I have articles of impeachment to impeach Joe Biden, Kamala Harris. We cannot take another three years of this poor, failed leadership. You know, at this point, it had only been eight months when she did this. Biden had only been in office for eight months. And things were honestly at that time going reasonably well. Not bad. The point here is that she went to a church and held a public event there to try to encourage people to vote more, get more politically involved, just keep listening. It gets even worse than this. We are sons and daughters of revolutionaries. They went to battle for a lot less. That is an open call for violence in my mind. I don't know why she's not in jail for that, honestly. They took a stand for a lot less. And it's time we get involved. I need you involved at every local level. I need you speaking up. I need the world to hear your voice. You know the word of God, and you know that there is power in your words. There you go. She's desperately 
trying to get religious zealots into public office. She didn't openly say, I am a Christian nationalist, but what she's doing is pushing people toward Christian nationalism. What she's doing by going to these church events, by saying the things that she said at TPUSA, it's all an attempt to get people to be more radical. It's, a, it's an attempt to get religious people to kick less religious people out of government and replace them. This one was June 29th, 2022. This is Lauren Boebert pulling the mask off, basically. Listen to this one. The reason we had so many overreaching regulations in our nation is because the church complied. The church is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. That is not how our founding fathers intended it. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk that's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter, and it means nothing like what they say it does. Actually, it is the first sentence in the Constitution. It's called the Establishment Clause. It is, in fact, in the Constitution. It is the First Amendment. But, you know, this is all an attempt to slowly but gradually move us into a Christian nationalist state. This is what the goal was from the start. And I guess she saw her opportunity and took it. This is the first instance that I've heard where she openly came out and said separation of church and state is evil. The church should be running the government. We should be, the pastors should be leading the government. Like there shouldn't be a U.S. government. There should just be pastors that are making laws for us. That This is the first example that I remember seeing of it. And since she opened the door with this one, she's gotten more and more extreme. She said more and more disturbing stuff. This one came out late July 2022. This was an appearance with, I believe, Graham Allen. I think this is Graham Allen on the left. Anyway, listen to what she has to say in this clip. Uh, so, so you're you're exactly right. Um, we're we're not advocating for a theocracy, um, but the church is supposed to um, direct government, not the. We're not advocating for a theocracy, but the church is supposed to direct government. That is literally what a theocracy is: the church directing the government. I don't understand. What is she talking about? This makes no sense whatsoever. She is advocating for a theocracy. That is exactly what she's doing. Um, direct government, not the opposite yeah. uh, way. The church is supposed completely. to influence government. And, yeah. and, and we need to be so involved in what is going on in our government. I mean, the Bible says that the government rests on, on, on his shoulders, on, yeah. on God's shoulders. You know, so uh, I, I also... I Actually, I remember, the, I remember Jesus saying... Pay to Caesar what is Caesar's, pay to God what is God's. Basically, stay out of government. Just stay out of government and serve God with your whole heart, mind, soul, body, strength, and whatever else you've got in you. That's what I remember from the Bible. Am I missing something? Is she selectively picking out verses that would benefit her personally? Because that's what it seems like to me. So, I hate that they say that this is in the Constitution. Oh, well, and that's Read my, the dang that's constitution. No, it's no, not in there. It's well, a letter. Um. Now, what she's talking about is a letter between Thomas Jefferson and Danbury Baptist Church. Uh, Thomas Jefferson specifically laid out exactly how he wanted the government to run. Okay, let me tell you what the situation was. There was a church that was running a town in Connecticut. The church controlled the government there and, and called the shots. It was a state church. And Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to another church who's complaining about it. And he said, yeah, I agree that that should not be the case. We shouldn't have a state religion at all. It would be unconstitutional because the Constitution says the government shall not establish a state religion, basically. It's the First Amendment, first fucking sentence. And Thomas Jefferson said, you're absolutely right, Danbury Baptist Church. This is not right. And eventually the Supreme Court decided you can't have a state religion. Agreed with Thomas Jefferson's letter. 
which removed the Calvinist denomination from power in the state of Connecticut at the time. That's what it's all about. That's what she's talking about. It was a letter between Thomas Jefferson and Danbury Baptist Church explaining exactly what the intent of the Constitution was when it said the U.S. government or the government will not establish a state religion, basically. And here she is discounting it, saying it was in a letter. It's not in the Constitution. I get completely ignoring the fact that it's the first sentence in the Constitution. Keep listening to what she had to say to Graham Allen here. Constitution, no, it's no, not in there. It's a letter. Um, but the church is supposed to um, direct government, not the opposite yeah. uh, way. The church is supposed completely. to influence government. And, yeah. and and we need to be so involved in what is going on in our government. I mean, the Bible says that the government rests on, on, on his shoulders, on, yeah. on God's shoulders. Well, what I'm seeing now with moral issues like Roe v. Wade mm-hmm. and, 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 and things like that, the church is now copying government talking points in saying, well, actually, that's a that's a political issue. So, so you sad. know, we, 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 we can't talk about those things. What church? Which church are you talking about? Which church said that? I haven't heard that from a single church. This is the strategy. This is what they do. This is called weasel words. People like Graham Allen and Lauren Boebert and others will say things like, they are out to get you. They're trying to teach gender ideology to your five-year-old. They say, uh, these churches out here say that we can't talk about things because it's a political issue. Which churches? Which teachers are trying to teach gender ideology to your five-year-old? Which ones specifically? Can you name one? Just one. I'll take one example of this happening anywhere in the country out of 330 million people. I haven't seen a single example of any of this, let alone a giant movement behind it. There is no movement of churches saying we can't talk about Roe v. Wade because the government says that's political and we're not allowed to. That's incorrect. You're perfectly allowed to talk about it if you want to. That's not against the law. There is no movement trying to tell five-year-olds that they are in the wrong body. That's not happening. There is no movement behind it. This is called going on the offense. When you're a public figure or when you're dealing with things on a, a grand scale, like on a countrywide scale, when you're being attacked with one of your beliefs or, or ideals or, or whatever else, when you're on the defensive, what you're supposed to do is Stay completely silent or deny it and just leave it at that. Stay silent or deny. One of those two things. That's why when Republicans go on the attack, they tend to go with attacks that are quippy and twist things out of proportion and are really hard to explain and correct. There's a lot of nuance involved. So, for example, like John Stewart recently tried to get a bill passed that would pay for veterans health care who got sick from standing near burn pits when they were overseas. Pretty straightforward act, right? Give like eight hundred billion dollars or I don't know, eight hundred million dollars or something to veterans who need health care because they got cancer from standing around burn pits. Ted Cruz comes out and says There's a lot of discretionary spending in there. It's pork. They're just trying to use it as a slush fund. Now, Jon Stewart is on the defensive and has to go through the process of making a big, long two-minute video explaining what discretionary and mandatory spending are and why Ted Cruz is full of it. All people heard was Ted Cruz saying, This is spending a lot of taxpayer money, and we don't know where it's going. That's all they heard. Now, the rebuttal, the correction from Jon Stewart is nuanced and difficult to explain, and it's going to take time and effort, and it's going to take your attention for a couple of minutes to figure out what the difference is between discretionary and mandatory spending and why Ted Cruz was wrong about this. This is how you do it. This is how you go on the offense. This is how you go on the defense with this stuff. That is what Graham Allen 
and Lauren Boebert tend to do. They go on the offense, they accuse people of things in these short, quippy things, just real fast, rapid fire, attack people with these things, and it takes 10 minutes to explain what they're doing and why it's incorrect. It takes 10 minutes to set the record straight. That's why when you're defending yourself from something, you're just supposed to keep your mouth shut because rebutting it, fixing it, adding that extra nuance validates the claim, even if it's not true. So Lauren Boebert and Graham Allen will come in and they'll say, these groomers are teaching five-year-olds that they're actually women in a man's body or something like that. That's not happening, like literally anywhere. But acknowledging that they're even saying it is spreading the idea around to more people in the first place. This is how offense and defense work. The, the Democratic Party is constantly on the defense, constantly in these culture war issues. The Republicans are always coming out with some new, completely absurd accusation against them. The Democratic Party needs to start going on the offense in these culture war issues and pointing out how absolutely disturbing and disgusting the behavior is of some of these Republicans. Anyway, let's keep listening to Boebert. Now copying government talking points and saying, well, actually, that's a that's a political issue. Yeah. And this is another perfect example. What we just listened to with Graham Allen and Lauren Boebert. Which churches are saying that? This is them going on the offense, making things up, pretending that there are churches out there who are afraid to speak up because it gets people fired up and upset and angry and makes them feel persecuted. This is all part of the culture war BS. So, so you sad. know, we, 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 we can't talk about those things. What's the what is the answer to that how do we how do we actually fix that i mean i can talk all the time all the churches need to just do it anyway and then they just need to talk about this this isn't a problem this is a non-existent problem there are no churches out there who want to say something about roe v wade but they're too afraid because they think the government will come after them this isn't happening who is doing this specifically tell me which churches are experiencing this problem it's not against the law for them to do for one thing, and for another, there is no evidence that any churches are keeping their mouths shut about government issues. Why would they? From a political standpoint, I mean, what can actually be done to fix this? Yeah, well, there, the, you know, in churches, it's it's legal to actually have voter registration. You can have voter registration in your church. Really? That, yes, you can. Um, and, and that's not saying vote for this candidate, vote for this party. You're simply registering somebody to vote. Um, so Right. What she's saying here, she's pointing out correctly that the only rule about what you're allowed to say in church is you're not allowed to specifically endorse or oppose specific candidates for office in your church. You can put out voter registration cards. You can tell them to vote your conscience, vote your Bible, and you can talk about all the culture war issues you want in church. It be effectively guaranteeing that the, they will vote for the candidate you want them to vote for. There is no, effectively, there is no law that's preventing churches from making their congregation vote the way they want them to. It is the thinnest veneer of protection between separation of church and state. And Republicans aren't even happy with the thinnest veneer. They want to start punching holes in it anyway which is exactly what they're doing. Answering somebody to vote. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's something that's really easy to do. But also, I mean, we, we have to speak truth. We have to speak the word. And, uh, and, and it's okay to tell people to vote your Bible. Yeah. You know, you, you don't have to name a person. You yeah. know, who, who stands... That is literally the only rule. You can't name a person by name. That's it. For life, who, who stands for freedom, for liberty, for uh, the freedom for the church to assemble? Uh, you know, it's, it's okay to say that and have these conversations, but we have to speak truth. We have to be loud about it. If we are silent, we lose by default. So let me tell you guys how we fix this problem, okay? People always ask, what do we do? How do we work on this? How do we solve this? And the answers are the same on my channel, 
on David Pakman's channel. Anywhere you look, the answers are the same. Vote, phone bank for politicians, donate to them if possible. Those are the those are the solutions. Except I have one more suggestion for you guys. One more solution that you can try. I've been talking about the culture war a lot tonight and going on the offensive and dealing with being defensive. Here's my recommendation for you guys. If you feel like if you've already voted, if you have already donated to political campaigns, if you've already phone banked for these people and you don't know what else to do next, I'll tell you exactly what the right does. This is how QAnon got so famous. This is how they got so big. They made memes. They made memes. They made memes out the wazoo. Make them comprehensive. The difference between memes that the left makes and memes that the the right makes is we're not going to make memes that are deceptive or immoral or target people to hate them or any of that, right? I don't want to make memes that inspire hate or mislead people. But that is how we get attention. That's how we go on the offensive. Start culture war issues against the right without being deceptive, without attacking people. Make memes. Post them everywhere. Not just in political spaces like under Marjorie Taylor Greene's Twitter timeline, but in non-political spaces too. That is how QAnon drew so much attention, and that's what the left needs to start doing too. When you see a meme that somebody else created, spread it. Bring it somewhere else. Send it to your family members. Get on Facebook, where all of your over 80 family members reside and where they all get their news, and start sending it out to every one of them in DMs. Send it out to every single person on your friends list, in your contacts list. Intelligent, succinct, Political memes that perfectly explain the situation without being deceptive or spreading misinformation. In my opinion, that is one thing that you can do, aside from voting, phone banking, or donating to politicians' campaigns. Spread memes. Do it like your 60-year-old uncle does about Trump memes. There's one more clip I have about Lauren Boebert, though. I want to bring this back to her Christian nationalism and show you exactly where she is now. This one's from July 14th, 2022. Check this out. Uh, Maybe we need to have some sort of legislation that requires Constitution Alive and biblical citizenship training in our schools. Uh, And and that's how we get things turned around. Uh, But there, there has to be real leadership from the Republicans, especially now. Biblical citizenship tests. Biblical citizenship. That means you have to take a test to be a U.S. citizen that determines your level of knowledge on the Bible. If you don't know much about the Bible, you can't be a U.S. citizen. I'm telling you guys, this exact timeline happened in 1930s and 1940s Germany. This exact thing. If you were Jewish, you weren't allowed to be a part of government. If you were Jewish, they started putting you in ghettos. And eventually, they found a justification to send the police out to take them out. And when that was entirely too traumatic for the police, they just had them arrested and taken to camps. We are on the timeline right now. And Lauren Boebert is pushing us further along. This is concerning stuff. We're in a deeply concerning part of U.S. history right now. If you disagree with me or anything that I've said in this clip, let me know. I want to hear from you. Let me know in the comments or on Twitter at Telltale Atheist. Bobert. Lauren Bobert, if you will. Uh, Some people pronounce her name Bear, and that's my preferred pronunciation. I don't know how she feels about it, but I like it, personally. Do you think she'd be upset by the pronunciation Bear, or would she be on board? Why doesn't she go by Lauren Bear? That is objectively a better name, isn't it? 
Next, we're gonna talk about the woman who leaked private voter data to Mike Lindell, losing her election for Secretary of State. Give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you wanna see me continue to do it, check out my Patreon. You can also check out my Telltale Unfiltered channel, Twitter, and Teespring. All links can be found in the description. I'm sure we all know exactly who Mike Lindell is, but just in case somebody's watching this five years in the future, let me give you guys a little primer on the bizarre things that he's had to say recently because somebody extremely relevant in the Trump world and in the Lindell world just got in a lot of trouble. So I want to catch you guys up on who he is and what he's been up to lately so we can focus in on the shitstorm that Tina Peters has just found herself in. This is Mike Lindell from early February 2022 coming completely off the rails because Fox News stopped showing his nonsensical fraud claims. He is so upset with them that he makes a questionable suggestion on his Lindell TV or the Lindell Report TV show. Check this clip out controls that are on my facebook and they go there's no evidence mike give it up um there is no evidence just go over to lindell tv and go to the number lindell tv too and you're gonna see garland on there pouring out the evidence from georgia and then you know it won't it be funny because then it, when fox says we're all american when he, when fox calls the united states of america all the people liars and our great president donald trump a liar we say well fox here, why don't you run this tape on your show instead of Sean Hannity and run it and then and watch the stuff come out, you know? Then- right, this guy is just losing it right now. Does it seem like that to anybody else? He's like, it's almost like he's in a manic state right now, just completely wild eyed and, and doesn't know like what's happening around him and he's stress it, it looks like he's been running his hand through his hair so much that he's like got a bald spot in it practically come out you know then it, maybe we should get our cyber guys brandon that looked at all the evidence to hook up our stream to foxes you know like they have, like they all attack they all attack lindell tv all the time we can attack can you imagine this is sean hannity all of a sudden breaking news right out of georgia we can't even put the, the the evidence pouring in, the pouring in Arizona, pouring in Wisconsin, <laughs> and Fox would you'd have the Murdochs going, oh no, what are we gonna do? The truth is out. We're the liars. Hey, why don't you just play it on your show? This TV show is the Lindell Report on Lindell TV. Show us, show us the evidence. Why are you talking about hacking Fox News? Dude is talking about hacking Fox News. I don't want to undercut the relevance of that. He's talking about hacking Fox News to play the evidence on that. Play it here. I'd love to see it. Show it. If you have evidence, let's see it, man. There is none. Here's the thing about Lindell. He doesn't have evidence, but he does have voter data. He got voter data from a woman named Tina Peters. She leaked voter data to Mike Lindell when she was in a position of power and capable of accessing that kind of stuff. So Lindell does have access to classified information, or I, I don't know if it, I don't know if it's classified or, or what it would be, but secret, private information, private voter data. Voter data is not evidence. We'll get to Tina Peters in a second. I just want to remind you of Mike Lindell and the crazy stuff that he's had to say recently. This next clip is from early March 2022, and he threatened to sue all machines. Listen to this one. Um, I'm going to tell you right now we're doing I've been working on it five months and we're doing a class action. You know, actually, I'm announcing it here. I announced it on my program. You all watch FrankSpeech.com. Yeah. Um, Keep watching. <laughs> um, the, um, but it's a class action lawsuit against all machines and that they're defective devices. 
Uh, I, don't you love it how like all of the claims that Mike Lindell makes never materialize like ever? You're going to sue all machines. Interesting. There are examples throughout U.S. history of lawsuits against inanimate objects. Like, for example, civil forfeiture. I think the way that civil forfeiture is set up where police basically confiscate money that you have on you and, and you just don't get it back. I think that's kind of like suing money legally or i think you can sue the money to get it back or something like that i don't even know anyway there are a couple of odd examples in u.s law of people suing inanimate objects but mike lindell coming out here and claiming to sue all machines like this is simply bizarre which machines like what is he even talking about what would the laws Who's the plaintiff? Who's going to get... Uh, why are they suing the machine? Like, what are they trying to get out of it? Uh, it? It's just all nonsense. The guy is completely off the rails and has been for not six months, not a year. Honestly, has the guy ever been in touch with reality? I don't know. I don't know. It's been at least two years that this guy is completely out of touch with reality. Completely. And that brings us neatly to Tina Peters. As I mentioned earlier, Tina Peters, the person on the right, she went on Steve Bannon's show, which, by the way, is also on Lindell TV. Tina Peters was, I don't remember, is Secretary of State, maybe. I'm not sure what her position was, but she had access to private voter data, and she leaked that private voter data to Mike Lindell. And she went to jail for it. She got charged with felonies, to my knowledge. She went on Steve Bannon's show here to talk about the terrible experience that she had being persecuted for leaking private voter data to a nutcase. Listen to what she had to say about what it was like being persecuted for doing such a thing, mid-March 2022. Her country... What were the thoughts in your mind that night when you went to bed? Well, unfortunately, I didn't go to bed. Um, they keep the lights on 24-7. They have it. You sleep on a, a one-inch uh, plastic mattress with no pillow, no sheet, uh, just barely covering up with, with a, a blanket. And uh, with, in my case, uh, there were five other women in this particular room that I was in. Uh, I can't even call it a room. It, it was, well, it was a jail cell. You know, I would have sympathy for her if she gave a shit about prisoners' rights, if she cared about improving conditions for prisoners, because that's something that I stand for. You know what she's talking about? She's talking about how persecuted she was. She doesn't care about how badly prisoners are treated. She cares about how badly she was treated for all she cares those five other women and every other woman in that jail that she was in can sit there and rot she doesn't care about them she cares about her so i have no sympathy tina none i've been talking about improving prisoners living conditions since i've had a platform I've been talking about the fact that slavery is still legal in the United States in the form of prisoners. And she didn't care. She hasn't cared this entire time. She didn't care before she went to jail. She didn't care when she was in jail. And she doesn't care now. She cares that she feels like she's being politically persecuted for committing felonies for breaking the law by giving Mike Lindell private voter data. With, with a, a blanket. And uh, with, in my case, uh, there were five other women in this particular room that I was in. Uh, I can't even call it a room. It, it was, well, it was a jail cell with a toilet. Uh, and my chief deputy was in a little bit larger room with nine other women in her cell. Uh, they did not, they, it was a no contact. They did not allow us to communicate, contact, be together. Um, the, the people that were in there were just hopeless. It was so sad. The food in there, I would have eaten my dog's vomit rather than eat that food. It was awful what they're serving to these people. 
She doesn't care what they're serving to these people. She cares what they're serving to her. She has never cared about or fought for prisoners' rights. She only complains about how she's treated for breaking the law and violating how many tens of thousands of people's personal privacy. So here's where it gets interesting. I was talking about, T- or I talked about Tina Peters, uh, I don't know, back in April, actually, so I don't, a few months ago. Anyway, I talked about her a while back when all of this was going down. April 6, 2022, NBC News, I think, broke this story. This was a pretty crazy deal. Listen to this. For Republican Mesa County Clerk Tina Peters. She faces felony charges accused of tampering with her county's election equipment. She also has to answer to an ethics complaint accusing her of accepting more money in gifts for her legal defense than an elected leader is allowed by the state constitution. Support for Peters comes in the form of the pillow guy. Mr. Lindell, how much? No way. What are the chances, huh? Comes in the form of the pillow guy. Who would have thought? She leaks private voter data to Mike Lindell. And he supports her re-election or supports her election bid to Secretary of State of Colorado. She was a clerk, and now she's running for Secretary of State. Accusing her of accepting more money in gifts for her legal defense than an elected leader is allowed by the state constitution. That's going to be relevant in a second. Just keep listening with that in the back of your head. Support for Peters comes in the form of the pillow guy. Mr. Lindell, how much have you raised for Tina Peters' legal defense fund? Okay, now if he says anything over what is legally allowed, then he is getting himself and Tina Peters into a world of shit. I, I, I just put all the money in myself. How much so, is that? I don't know. I probably put in three, four, five, maybe 800000 of my own money. Unless you're a close friend or family member of an elected leader, you're limited in how much you can gift. You can only give someone a gift of $65. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, boy. Mike Lindell just dug a hole for himself and for Tina Peters. This is not good. Oh, my God. Actually, it's good for us. I'm glad that Mike Lindell was dumb enough to say something like that to a reporter without talking to a lawyer or thinking first so that we have all of this on record and can charge Tina Peters or at least sue her for an ethics violation at the very least. Per calendar year. Jane Feldman was once executive director of the Independent Ethics Commission. Now she's part of the legal team in the ethics complaint against Peters. And if Peters receives more than she's allowed, she could be fined twice the amount. So if Lindell really gave her $800,000 to pay for her legal defense, the fine could be expensive. That's $1.6 million. Ouch. And did you hear what Lindell said? He put all of the money in himself. He put all the money in himself. That means... Basically, every penny that she had in her election fund pretty much came from Lindell. It was almost entirely from him. She does not have that much extra to spend on fines, is the point here. But there is wiggle room if Lindell is a close friend. Except listen to how he answered a question about flying Peters around on his personal plane last year. I'll give rides from people all over the country. I had never met Tina Peters. Oh, I love it. So Mike Lindell thought that it was more beneficial to him if he didn't know Tina Peters. The The thing here is, if he had been a close personal friend, it would have made it legal for him to have donated $800,000 to her election fund. But he didn't know that. So he comes out here and starts yelling at journalists, claiming he doesn't know her. He is so dumb sometimes. I love it. I had never met Tina Peters. That's what the plane ride you're talking about. She came to the cyber support with the group from Colorado. I picked people up. I invited all 50 states. All 50 states were represented. There's your answer. Another stupid question by a stupid journalist. Yeah, it's the journalists that's stupid. Absolutely, Mike. Definitely. Love this. This is so funny, man. A journalist. But here's why it's not a stupid question. If you had just met her, you weren't a close friend of hers. I just met her that day. Another dumb question. If- oh, my God. I'm eating this up. Mike Lindell is sometimes he acts like the dumbest person on planet Earth, and I just love it to death. It's fantastic. Look at this angry look on his face, too. Oh, I love it. 
Another dumb question. If he said he had just met her and they had no prior relationship, it's very hard to argue that he was a personal friend. Oh, I love it to death, dude. Well, here's the interesting news about the whole situation. Tina Peters lost her election. She lost. All that money that Mike Lindell donated is down the drain because she isn't going to win the Secretary of State race, as it turns out. Uh, and she's come out and responded to the fact that she lost the election. Check this out. Late July 2022, this is what she had to say. This was a setup from the beginning. But when they saw that I had such a following and that I was going to win this, they front-loaded ballots. Now, if you read report number... Did anybody expect any differently? Of course she's going to come out and claim that there was election fraud. Donald Trump paved the way for the destruction of democracy. Sow the seeds of doubt in our election system and democracy will surely fall. That is exactly what happened with Trump and that is the path that Tina Peters is following. And she knows this. You can't tell me she doesn't know she's destroying democracy by falsely claiming that they cheated in the election. She's even making up a method of cheating, front-loading ballots, blah, blah, blah. It's complete nonsense. Front-loaded ballots. Now, if you read report number three and Jeff, uh, Jeffrey O'Donnell, the author of that report, you will see that this is exactly what they did this time. They had to take me out. And why would a judge, a, a judge appointed by our radical baby uh, killing uh, uh, laws, uh, Jared Polis, why would a judge appointed by him issue two arrest warrants, two in one week? For Tina Peters? This past week. They want to take me out and because they know that I know what's going on in the machine, Steve. Or, or, bear with me, is it possible maybe you broke the law and that's why they filed two arrest warrants? Do you think that's a possibility? Of course not. She is absolutely obsessed with the idea that she's the victim and everybody else is trying to victimize her. She's just this good Christian woman who's trying to violate people's privacy rights by leaking private voter data to Mike Lindell and others, Donald Trump and whoever else will take it. Disgusting. Disgusting that she was even running. Disgusting that she violated campaign finance laws. Disgusting that she didn't go to jail for longer than she did. Disgusting that she was even allowed to run again in the first place. And disgusting that after she lost, she continued to claim she was being persecuted, that there was election fraud and all this other nonsense. Absolutely despicable that she would do things like this. Deeply, deeply wrong. But that is what I've come to expect from Trumpists, from people following in Trump's footsteps. He laid the groundwork for this kind of a response to elections. We're going to be we're going to be dealing with Republicans claiming election fraud every time they lose an election for the next 50 years probably because of Donald Trump. I'm not sure he knows just how much damage he did. He certainly doesn't care. He set out to do it. I don't believe for a second that he cares that he did immeasurable damage to U.S. democracy. Deeply, deeply disgusting to see people following in his footsteps, though. I'm just glad she lost. It's unfortunate to know, though, that there are still county clerks out there and secretaries of state and others who did support Donald Trump in the previous election and who might just be willing to flip the election or to decertify or send the wrong electors or whatever other schemes they have in mind if this type of situation arises again. At least it won't be Tina Peters this time. Brandon Kramer, I'm from Mesa County, Colorado. Tina Peters just got arrested again for violating parole. Fantastic. I love it. I love everything about it. Oh, my God. I love accountability. 
I don't want people serving time in jail. I want accountability. And that's what we're getting with Tina Peters at this moment. Uh, not enough. Certainly not enough. I'm glad she lost her election. I'm glad that she was rearrested for violating parole. We need more accountability nationwide, not just with Tina Peters, with everybody who's violating the law. Everybody who's being immoral be fantastic. If you disagree with my assessment, let me know in the comments or on Twitter at Telltale Atheist. Thank you guys for coming and giving this a listen, and I will talk to you next week. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, there's Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and coffee cups and stuff on there. You can also check out my other channels. I have a Telltale Unfiltered YouTube channel where I go through long-form videos like Kent Hovind's seminar series, Jehovah's Witnesses TV show, and televangelists prophesying about politics. And finally, you can check out my social media. If you have a question for me, the best way to ask it is to tweet it at me. I'm on there all the time, so check it out. All links are in the description as always. Anyway, so that's all I've got for you. Thanks for listening.